Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar express, The Importance of Placemaking in the Future of Retail, with our guest speaker, Donna Howitt, and which has been organized by the CIM Northwest Group. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, then you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. It will keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is hover your camera over the QR code you can see on the screen, and that will take you through to the Marketing Club sign-up page. So I would now like to introduce our guest speaker for today's session, Play Strategy Director at Liverpool One, Donna Howitt. Over to you, Donna. Thank you, Judith, and thanks to all of you for joining me today. I hope that this will be a very insightful 35 minutes or so, where I'll be talking to you about the importance of placemaking in the future of retail. We talk about future, but actually it's the now. Placemaking isn't a new concept uh, since the pandemic. It's something that we were doing already, although the pace of change in many ways, thanks to COVID, has never been so rapid. I've been at Liverpool One for almost 15 years and many things have changed. I guess it's effectively what keeps me here. The world is ever changing and brands need to change at pace or they won't survive. I'll explain what we mean by place shaping and I'll explain uh, the importance of brand. I'll then go on to look at a key future behaviour, not a trend, but perhaps a way of life. And specifically, I'm talking here about sustainability and the environment and how Liverpool One, like every brand, needs to consider its impact and how this influences the way we work and deliver in future. For the benefit of those who don't know Liverpool or perhaps Liverpool One now, let me remind you of Liverpool City Centre just over 15 years ago. The importance of this is to consider the importance of brand and brand perception in changing habits. Previously known as the Paradise Street Development Area, Grosvenor was appointed to rebuild the centre of Liverpool, a £1 billion project dubbed the biggest regeneration project of its kind in Europe. The city had to renew its link with its waterfront and it had to regain its status as a number one regional shopping destination. Shopping has always been a UK favourite. It's definitely a national pastime, but shops have had to be in the right place and of the right mix and of a sufficient quality to be economically stable. Prior to Liverpool One, 21 shops paid 90% of the total rents in the city, city centre. So the ambition for Grosvenor appointed to develop Liverpool One was massive and it was an extension to what Liverpool already offered, but it needed to be of a much higher quality, a broader appeal and better served by transport links, really integrating it into what was already there, but raising the quality substantially. And with the construction over several years, the Paradise Project became known to the general public and all those involved as Liverpool One. So the face of the city has changed. The development of Liverpool One has success successfully reconnected the heart of the city with its famous waterfront. Now it's easy to walk to and from the Royal Albert Dock in a matter of minutes um, and connected the heart of the city. And it's a connection that's not just enjoyed by the many residents and the locals in the area, but by the growing tourist population that Liverpool now enjoys. Liverpool One comprises 42 acres of the heart of the city centre. We've got over 700 residents, two hotels, and amongst the many shops, bars and restaurants, perhaps the jewel in the crown is a five acre park, which sits at the top of uh, three of the largest of three new car parks that are now operated by Q Park. The attraction of the mixed use development at Liverpool One is shown in the visitors, visitor numbers that we enjoy. And these peaked pre-pandemic at just over 29 million visits per year. And Liverpool One has continued to evolve over the, the last decade or more. For example, you can see here on the right hand side that in 2008, 88% of units were retail, 12% were leisure. Whereas now around 20% of brands are leisure led, including food and drink, and a rise in what we call competitive socialising, such as indoor golf, table tennis, and Escape Live, which has recently joined. The lineup remains very strong, and there are expected names on the high streets, such as Apple, Adidas, Zara, and John Lewis, all performing well alongside new names, such as Gordon Ramsay's Bread Street Kitchen and local coffee operator Bean Coffee. And later this year, Gravity will open uh, and is set to be one of the largest uh, gravity spaces outside of London, which will offer 
a mix of uh, e-go-karting, um, lots of competitive socialising over two floors, which takes the space of the former Debenhams unit. But the evolution of, uh, of gravity replacing traditional retail is significant in itself, uh, where visitors will be able to enjoy urban golf, much more modern food and uh, drink offering and a bar concept. Um, and it just demonstrates specifically for me how much the high street is changing and at, at such a speed. So with a vast change in, in the offer within the city centre and so much investment, our challenge over the years, uh, and none more so to this present day, is to ensure that we provide a visitor experience where people are willing to travel. We've gradually expanded our catchment from a very hyper-local audience, extending that catchment to attract audiences from far and wide. Visiting Liverpool One or any successful destination is no, sim no longer simply about shopping. When first established, visitors to some degree may still have shopped through necessity. But in, in 2022, now visitors come through choice and have done now for several years. They've chosen Liverpool One as a location to spend their leisure time. Shopping for necessity can be done online. For convenience, your shopping can be with you the next day or even the same day if you're willing to pay the price. But we're human beings and we're social animals and we crave experiences and togetherness. Our focus on the experience extends beyond those experiences you can enjoy in store, um, such as in the Apple shop, it's very much a showroom more than a shop. Um, and we focus on the whole experience that visitors coming into Liverpool can enjoy across the 42 acres of the Liverpool One estate. And we've successfully expanded our catchment by uh, a hot by a million regular um, a million people who regularly visit uh, Liverpool. The catchment now comprises 2.3 million people versus just 1.3 million when Liverpool One first opened to the public. And our latest research pre-COVID suggested that around 20% of visits came from tourism, uh, and that's a number that certainly wasn't realised over a decade ago. Um, to achieve such growth, we not only had to establish Liverpool One as a household name through a very effective media and PR strategy to achieve high levels of awareness, but we had to work hard to challenge perceptions to appeal to a broad target audience, winning their hearts and minds, perhaps off a backdrop of decline for the city. I've shown here an overview of our four audiences, four supergroups that are defined using the ACORN segmentation tool, ACORN segments the UK population into five main categories within which there are 17 groups and 59 individual profiles of person based on their lifestyle, their household income and their habits. Um, we've narrowed this, as you can see here, into four supergroups, which is far more manageable than 59 different individual categories. But we aim to appeal to families, to older generations and to students through a mix of retail and leisure and other experiences that motivate audiences in very different ways. In part, this comprises our marketing strategy, but the ultimate visitor experience is achieved through our placemaking strategy. But before I go on to that, I want to touch on the importance of brand. Many times throughout our growth, we've pondered upon what we call ourselves. Are we a shopping centre? No. Are we a city centre? Well, we're part of one but the city centre is way beyond our own invisible boundary lines. In written terms, any of you that have um, looked up and been online, will refer to ourselves as a retail and leisure destination, but that hardly trips off the tongue, does it? So usually, we just simply call ourselves Liverpool One. Now, I could take the entire presentation on brand alone, but I won't. But I will touch on the process that we worked through to develop our brand uh, and this, in, this still guides us today in everything that we deliver. So why is brand identity so important? For Liverpool One, it's because we've developed in a city that was known for more recently, before Liverpool One, a history of decline. And we needed to challenge perceptions and establish a new conversation. People are at the heart of Liverpool One. We aim to make our visitors smile because when it's all about people and people are at the centre of our thinking, we know that we're getting things right. And there are many processes and methods to develop a clear brand proposition. And at Liverpool One, we worked with a very experienced brand agency called Brand Vista, also responsible for developing strategies of many household names. Um, and from a destination perspective, 
um, for brands such as Merlin and Green King Pubs. There are different steps to follow and different approaches, but in every sense, it's important to understand who our competitors are and to have a clear understanding of our audiences. On knowing that, we set about understanding our brand purpose. And this exercise looked at what we're already saying to our audiences, for example, within many of our marketing communications. But more importantly, we undertook research to understand what people actually felt about us. And I'm sharing with you here, actually, our, what is our brand purpose? You can see there on the right hand side, our brand purpose is put simply to make our visitors smile. So we set about conducting a series of mini surveys and focus groups comprising Liverpool One team members, uh, people who worked in the various shops and bars and restaurants at Liverpool One, and of course, our visitors. The research allowed us to explore answers to some of the queries that are listed here on this slide. The process took several weeks and we found it upon this brand purpose to make our visitors smile. If we can achieve this within the resources that are available to us, we believe that we can deliver commercial success and long term growth. This has become a sort of sense check against everything that we do, even through to how we operate internally within our own business and to the way that we manage our the relationships with our, our occupiers. And when I say occupiers, I'm talking the shops, the bars, the restaurants and right the way through to even the manner by which we might deal with customer inquiries or any issues should they arise. And as part of the process, we also established a new set of values. We believe in each other. We all take responsibility. And above all, we have pride and we challenge ourselves on being brilliant. We feel that this ensures that we truly live the brand. So from brand to a closer look at placemaking, and a focus here allows us to develop a compelling brand narrative to truly deliver on our brand purpose. When we talk about placemaking, though, what do we actually mean? When we look at an identity, this is our brand, visually how we present it, um, how we talk about everything that we do, especially through our marketing and communications. But strategically, placemaking seeks to attract investment in the form of brands choosing to trade at Liverpool One. But for the context of this presentation, we focus on the sense of place from a visitor or a consumer perspective. We are committed to a high quality of public space. We are increasingly focused on the positive impact that we can have on the quality in life and the well-being of visitors, local residents, neighbouring communities and our city centre workforce. And through an in-house team of around 135 people, we're responsible for keeping 42 acres of space clean, safe and attractive. I've listed here some of the key aspects of placemaking and without reading them verbatim, um, I want to go on to be able to share examples of some of the elements that are listed here and how we've invested time, passion and pride into um, game changing elements of our strategy. We have to ensure that we operate a clean and a safe estate 365 days of the year and 24 hours a day. Without this, nothing else is worth it. The way I describe it is there's no point having icing on the cake if the cake is already crumbling. So through new technology on our estates, such as our Wi-Fi platforms, we continually measure the collective efforts of our strategy um, by following a small number of KPIs. The overriding being to repeatedly ask our visitors uh, the likelihood to recommend and their likelihood to revisit. Pleasingly, we score 98% on both of these key KPIs. And thanks to technology and through our app, we can keep checking this as we operate 365 days of the year. OK, so the visitor experience, more and more people, we believe, and I think research tells us, and I'm sure everybody can relate to this. They want to feel fill their lives with experiences, not always things. They want to have stories to tell, not just stuff to show, perhaps more so now post COVID or with COVID, at least in the rearview mirror. Um, we're seeing that people are enjoying getting back out and coming together again. We believe alongside a, a great lineup of brands um, that we need to deliver experiences that build loyalty. So whilst our occupiers inside the retail units themselves, they focus on similar quality experiences and they'll always invest in customer service and training of their own their own staff. Whilst that's happening, we focus on the experiences around the public realm. We call it enlivenment. And our aim is to entertain people, engage with people, involve them 
and also educate. I've mentioned before, people are at the heart of Liverpool. One, if you remember our brand purpose, we want to make our visitors smile. The well-being of everyone is centre place in our thinking for everything that we do. And we support people and communities and are committed to working with local arts and cultural organisations and to collaborate on citywide initiatives. Our approach is simple to enlivening our, our places and our spaces. Know your audience. I previously showed you very briefly our broad audiences, you know, more mature audiences, families, millennials, students. Variety is key to appeal to everybody, but alienate none. Every enlivenment proposal that we consider is considered alongside our values. We take responsibility to delivering to the highest of standards, or we won't do it at all. We have a number of overarching themes in our approach to enlivening Liverpool One, and music, sport, art and culture um, are key. I'm going to take a couple of moments to share with you some of the highlights. For those of you that know Liverpool, you will absolutely be familiar with Tickle the Ivories. Um, we have over 100 performers already lined up to perform uh, this summer uh, for 10 weeks of free music when the pianos go back out into our public realm from tomorrow. This is a key partnership with Open Culture and it is a piano busking festival that realises some real talent at grassroots level together with attracting in some famous names and faces. The reason we partner with Open Culture and the collaboration here is key is because we share the same brand values Open Culture want you and everybody to know uh, that you could be more arty than you believe. They want you to get involved in more arty stuff around Merseyside, mainly because it's proven to make your life a little bit better. Open Culture is an independent social enterprise working collaboratively across the region to increase the profile engagement in arts. They put on other attractions such as Light Night in Liverpool and various winter and summer arts markets. Uh, but the organisations developed projects such as Tickle the Ivories with Liverpool One um, because, put simply, they feel it just makes people feel happier. So as part of our festival, we'll also provide free piano lessons. And we've discovered some real talent from young children that have never had the chance to play a piano before. They stumbled upon it in Liverpool One. They like the feel of it. And then they've managed to enjoy some free music lessons and then continue that um, through various funding streams within within their own um, schooling. We have to be careful with our programming because as you saw in an earlier slide, Liverpool One isn't just uh, home to uh, a large number of visitors, it's also home to 750 residents or so. So we have to program the pianos carefully at various times of the day and in various locations around the estate. Um, but this is uh, an initiative that has just gone from strength to strength and a key part of our place making and a reason why people choose to come to Liverpool One versus uh, perhaps a retail park or something uh, perhaps even more convenient just down the road. I mentioned that sport uh, is another key theme. For several years we've celebrated most of the nation's sporting endeavours from football World Cups to the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games. We even hosted the Netball World Cup Fan Park back in 2008 which provided a huge draw particularly for women and girls and a key audience for us when it comes to shopping. Much of our community engagement is rooted in grassroots sports and summer sports days have been held on Shabazz Park, partnering with the likes of Liverpool John Moores University, for example, and not just to provide free activity that make, makes people feel good, but it also provides a platform for local students to develop their skills and integrate with their studies. And to the environment itself, build it and they will come, <laughs> but actually make it even better than that. So for those audiences that don't want to maybe partake in the sporting activity or the musical activity, they still want to enjoy our environment. Remember, if you just want to buy products, do it online. But if you want to enjoy your leisure time, head to places that show that they care for you and they want to welcome you. We provide attractive places to dwell. Um, and one of the things that stood out for me, I've mentioned briefly the uh, brand process that we went through and the number of focus groups that we held uh, when uncovering the purpose of our brand. And one participant described Liverpool One as a place like no other and certainly not a shopping centre. And on to events. Our events become key moments in our calendar. Reasons to visit at a particular time. Um, some of them might be one-off events. Um, and some of them might extend for over a period of weeks, appealing to different demographics. Two examples that I've selected here 
uh, take us from dogs to dinosaurs. So the Liverpool One Dog Show first held last year as a new entry to our events calendar post-COVID saw over 200 registrations for entries in the first three days of opening this and it was a hugely popular day in September on Chivas Park and the show is back this September due to popular demand. On a much larger scale, Dinosaurs Unleashed. Uh, this ran in uh, 2018 um, in quarter two where we had a footfall target of two and a half million visitors that we wanted to welcome into Liverpool One over a three month period. The aim of this promotion was to increase repeat visitation during the campaign period, get people to stay on our estate for longer. Um, and we promoted uh, an app um, to encourage people to download uh, the Dinosaurs Unleashed app, which would allow them to enjoy an egg hunt um, around our estate uh, where they could scan a QR code on the, on the egg. They could hatch their dinosaur. And as you can see here, they could hatch T-Rex and march their T-Rex down, down Paradise Street. Uh, they could take their dinosaurs into stores, or they could go up onto the newly named Shavasic Park, um, where they could um, get up close and personal um, with some of our make-believe dinosaurs, or send their own hatched dinosaurs into a battle arena. Uh, this was hugely successful, and we had over 20,000 downloads, um, significant growth to our database, and we continue to have a relationship with many of those families uh, that took part in Dinosaurs Unleashed and continue to, to tell them about other activities that they can enjoy with their families um, as they form part of our database and regularly receive our, our e-communications. Other events that are hosted that you can see here supporting the retail calendar and helping to drive sales at key times as well. Student events held twice a year. Halloween, uh, more and more shops, you'll probably have noticed yourself, uh, really coming on board with Halloween as something seasonal for retail to get behind and bars and restaurants too. Um, so they put on their own activity and they run their own promotions. But we go the extra mile and we also enliven our public spaces. So you can see here, giant mechanical spider that paraded through the estate, greeting customers and entertaining children. Now you can't get that online. And of course, there's our Christmas light switch on. So it's moved from a traditional light switch on where now each year on the first uh, Friday of the month in November, our lights are turned on and we partner with many of the city's pantomimes uh, and entertainment venues to give visitors a chance to sample some of what the city has in store for the season. For some, it's become a key date in their calendar and very much the start of Christmas. And finally, whilst looking at the changing reasons to visit, earlier this year, we launched our first heritage trail Available on the app, the audio tour takes you across 16 locations on the Liverpool One estate, telling its history long before 2008 when Liverpool One was established. In fact, over 300 years of heritage. This was delivered in close collaboration with National Museums Liverpool and provides another free to enjoy experience alongside shopping and dining in the centre of the city. You can appreciate even more how the sense of place and authenticity in the makeup of Liverpool One is central to its evolution and place of choice for many brands, considering the best location for them to trade. And speaking about evolution, it would be remiss not to consider our future journey without sustainability being at the core of thought processes as we, as we move ahead. The environment and the health of our communities has never been so top of mind as it has been since the impact of the pandemic. When people stopped commuting and businesses stopped trading, the world appeared cleaner and greener and the sky perhaps a little more blue. We've been operating in a state of normalish now for a few months, but things aren't quite as they were. And experiences of the last couple of years through the pandemic has shown that new learned behaviours won't be forgotten in a hurry. Like many brands, we have to look at what customers want and uncover any blind spots in what we're delivering. We have to upskill in our knowledge base and seek ways to keep doing what we do well whilst keeping people and planet at the centre of our thinking. Thankfully, we're not starting from scratch. People have always been at the centre of our planning and the very nature of Shivas Park, which acts as a green lung in the city, still holds strong. Our sustainability strategy rests on two interconnecting limbs, people and environment. Represented here first, you can see uh, proudly displayed our green flag accreditation, um, which we have maintained for Shivas Park for several years. 
and the Liverpool One Foundation, which supports charities working with young people and mental health. It's so, so far donated almost three million pounds to charities across the Liverpool city region. And we have a number of pillars within our sustainability strategy, and you can learn more about these on our website. But for the purpose of this session, rather than go through all of those pillars, I just wanted to share how sustainability can lead to innovation and creativity right the way through to when it comes to placemaking. Focusing on the environment first, through creativity and consideration of the environment, Liverpool One is home to tens of thousands of resident bees. High up on the rooftops, they've so far produced two large batches of honey that have been distributed for free to local schools and charitable groups. In the centre here, you can see our bug hotel, tens of thousands of bugs playing their part in maintaining the biodiversity on Shabbas Park, itself home to a rich, rich and wide variety of pollinating plants and vertebrae. And you can see on the right how much we love our trees. With over 130 trees in Liverpool One, we like to tell the importance of trees in managing air, quali air quality, uh, reducing pollution and encouraging biodiversity. Last Christmas, we part partnered with the Mersey Forest to give Christmas trees away to be planted by our visitors. And to people and communities, our grant giving foundation is central to the investment in young people especially those who struggle with their mental health. We have built strong relationships with many children and with, with charities, whilst raising funding for them is essential. We also host an act, a wide variety of activity across key dates, such as Youth Mental Health Day or National Mental Health Week, to bring outreach workers into the heart of Liverpool One to engage with our young people directly. They've worked out of units such as the Body Shop and Waterstones, to open up conversations of mental health outside of a typical school or medical environment. And a simple initiative that I love can be seen from the table topper to the right hand side here. Running in several of our bars and our restaurants are happy to chat tables, um, encourage people to sit down and just open up conversation. Shopping and dining is a social activity and we are social creatures and online becomes an obstacle to that. There's a very irony in the term social media something that has made our youth less sociable uh, more than ever when it comes to the physical sense. So I've shared with you at quite a pace um, some examples of the role that placemaking, um, the, the role that placemaking it, it takes in the future of our high streets and why it is so important when it comes to enlivening our cities or any other public space. We can see how much a sense of place is determined by personal experiences, social interactions and identities. The experiences that can be enjoyed are best fulfilled though by working with those organisations and partners of, of, that are within the city and actually become the very fabric of the city. So I hope that we've made a good start to Liverpool's most modern chapter by understanding its inheritance, its people, our, part, our purpose and the partners who operate here. So whilst I've presented a huge amount of activity in a very short space of time, I think that what we can see is the importance of collaboration. We collaborate to draw on the creativity of people within and outside of our boundaries by putting people at the heart of what we do. I'm sure that we have a key ingredient that is necessary in our success, and I'm very excited about what the next 15 years has in store. Brilliant. That's great. And thanks very much, Donna. And um, that was a very interesting presentation for, for someone who's had a chance to visit Liverpool just a couple of times briefly for work meetings. Um, it's certainly a place that I'm very keen to go back to and have a look around properly now that we're hopefully, as you say, the, the pandemic, it's not over, but it's in the rearview mirror. Um, so we're now going to have a short Q&A session. So our first question is, um, it's from someone who says, um, it's an observation, it says, it seems like um, Liverpool One, you're operating as a BID, a BID, a business investment district. Is that what, what it stands for and, and is that the case? Okay, so we, uh, we operate, we are a, um, a private management company that works alongside the Liverpool BID, Business Improvement District. Whilst um, you will have picked up, I've kind of explained we don't operate we we don't present ourselves as a shopping center otherwise anybody that is looking for that you might arrive and say where is the roof um that's not what i was expecting so we're very much part of the city center but actually our internal workings does mirror that of a shopping center 
Um, but we're a hybrid in many ways, and it's very hard to find um, competitors that are, well, not even competitors, it's very hard to find like-minded organisations that, that internally operate in the way that a, a traditional shopping centre might, but actually present um, more like a city centre. So we collaborate and work very, very closely alongside the Business Improvement District, which does a great job at supporting the wider retail district within the, within the city centre. But in itself, we aren't a bid. Right. OK. Next question. Um, which market research provider surveys or methodologies would you rely on to inform your marketing approach? OK, that's a good question. Thank you for that. Um, so from a market research perspective, um, and this is typical of a, of a shopping centre um, set up, we will um, undergo um, at least one peak exit survey a year, which is um, traditionally where you would have seen um, market researchers out across um, the, the public realm uh, talking to around a thousand uh, visitors to ask them everything from the shops that they're shopping in, the amount of time that they are spending within the, um, the, the shopping area, um, ratings in terms of customer satisfaction, whether that be sort of cleanliness, um, uh, ease of finding a store, um, all of those sort of typical questions. And that is done through, um, through that exit survey. Um, but we also undertake online brand tracking periodically. Um, and I think I mentioned before, if I kind of rewind back to a uh, brand um, and, you know, we've got a very, very clear understanding of our brand and we work very hard to live that brand and deliver. But we need to undertake research to understand if that's actually landing and is, is that really what people are taking from all of the activity that we do. And our online brand tracker is really uh, useful because that allows us to reach people that are not visitors to Liverpool One. And it allows us to ask questions as to why. You know, where are the barriers? Is it because they don't understand enough about what we do? They don't understand perhaps about the strength of the offer? Or is it simply because they're not um, willing or prepared or able to travel into Liverpool or just satisfied with another option? And, you know, we're really keen to understand if, they're satis if they are satisfied with the alternative, because what have they got that we don't and can, and can we learn from that? So online brand tracking is uh, really important to us. OK, um, now you've said that you don't have any comparable organisations to yourself. So you're not like a, a Newcastle Gates Head initiative as, as such, that type of destination marketing organisation. But you did use the word competitor when you were in your presentation there about competitor places elsewhere in the country. So if you were to, to sort of say if you were benchmarking yourself against another large regional city or, or a similar type of um, destination, where would you see your competitors being to get people to travel to the pool? Yeah, this this is this is a really interesting question because this depends on where we where we see ourselves. And you know, we say when when we're not a shopping centre, we 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 offer great shopping in in the way that other shopping centres do. But there's there's so much more to it. So we will take a look at um, the performance of traditional shopping centres, and we'll also take a look at the performance of city centres. And we tend to use those as context around our, our own sort of visitor numbers or our own sort of um, business performance. Um, if we were to look and learn from other organisations, those that, were, that are more relatable, then we would look at the likes of, say, a Trinity Leeds, um, which has also got more of a built environment, but again, sort of uh, um, very much de developed and um, delivered in the, the heart of Leeds uh, city centre. So. There are like-minded organisations and destinations that we will look at, but we look at them through a different lens. You know, if we're looking purely at food and drink, there are other areas for food and drink within the city, um, but we don't compete against other areas within the city. We work more collaboratively to bring people into Liverpool as a whole, um, hope that that experience is a good one and that those people come back and enjoy different aspects of the city from time to time. So. We don't have um, a set, defined list of competitors, but we do look specifically at retail. We do look at leisure. We do look at, at city centres. So, for example, in terms of um, a bounce back from, from COVID, we'll look at the performance of other UK cities to see how our footfall um, you know, does compare. And pleasingly, seeing that our visitor numbers are far outperforming the, the UK benchmark right now. Yeah. Have you had to adapt your strategy 
um, during, you know, in the light of the last two years, or have you been able to revert back to um, what your previous longer term plans were? We've had to adapt our strategy in light that people, um, certainly from a tourism perspective, you know, um, pre-pandemic tourism uh, figures got to around 20 percent. So around a fifth of our visitors were either domestic or international visitors. Um, because of the impact of COVID, um, we became very reliant on a more hyper-local audience. Um, and what we are seeing now over time is students are returning back to the city in particular, that we are starting to sort of level out again. But interestingly, what um, one of the benefits, I guess, that we've seen in such such difficult times is that, you know, people were forced to holiday in the UK, perhaps when they otherwise wouldn't have chosen uh, to do. And people have discovered Liverpool that perhaps wouldn't have discovered Liverpool if they were able to hop on a flight to Spain, for example. So we actually have seen an expansion of our of our catchment and we are seeing that people are traveling from some of those outer pockets of the sort of tertiary quaternary uh, catchment area. Um, our job now is to ensure that that visitor experience is absolutely first class and that they want to keep coming back. That's very interesting. Um, next question, um, as one said that many of the slides show the big brands like John Lewis. What does the retail mix in terms of independent shops and restaurants um, as opposed to national brands? Within within Liverpool one itself, um, because of the demand for units is is so high. You know, if there's a um, if you see any hoarded units, they won't be hoarded for long, and that's because the brand is exited and a new brand is coming in, and, and such is the rate of change. Um, in retail, driven by you know customer behaviour, they'll love a brand for a period of time and then move on to the to the next one. Um, our, our mix in terms of independence, we have a lot less independence, um, but we do work very closely with those that are keen to to come into Liverpool. One and a real success story behind brands like the Dog Bakery, um, mm. who started up as a as an independent trader on a on a, in a cart um, and then uh, took a kiosk. And we've made some good introductions for the dog bakery with other independents, such as uh, Bean Coffee. Um, but what we do, our, our intention and our aim is very much to work with the wider retail area and those people that know Liverpool One. You don't, there is a seamless integration uh, within the wider city. So you may not necessarily know when you're in Liverpool One or when you're outside of some of the areas of Liverpool One. And I think our, our um, focus has to be on uh, attracting retail into not just Liverpool One, but the wider city as well. Um, and there is a strong and thriving um, a zone on Bold Street, for example, for for independents, um, which is fantastic for the city. Um, you know, it's very much about bringing people into Liverpool, not just bringing them into Liverpool One and keeping them within these invisible boundaries that the boundaries that purposely weren't built to try and put people inside a particular zone, but actually to navigate the way around the city, whether that be from the waterfront through into the centre. So independents are very important to the city. More recently, we've um, just opened the vintage store, the largest of its kind in the UK, which has taken over in the former Topshop unit. So when you're marketing um, Liverpool One and the city as a whole, do you do any joint marketing initiatives with retailers and partner brands? Yes, we do. <laughs> we do. Uh, so our retailers, the best example, I think, is probably our student events. Um, and we collaborate with other organisations across the city, but particularly give uh, our retailers um, the platform um, to be able to give that friendly Liverpool welcome, particularly to new students arriving in the city for the first time. We also do a lot of work with uh, regional uh, press, so regional magazines, for example, taking an example would be some of the higher end brands um, and we'll work with them through various advertorials um, and media placements. And then we'll we'll um, work in collaboration with some of the region's events. So Grand National and Aintree, maybe one of them, or even this weekend, uh, the Bolsworth International Horse Show uh, will be sponsoring Ladies Day. And we've got a number of brands uh, that are working with us to have uh, some exposure so Timothy Alton, Russell and Bromley, Gordon Ramsay's Bread Street Kitchen, all names that are quite keen to connect with that outer catchment and remind them that they are now here in Liverpool and they're uh, not too far away. Okay um, so could you tell us how your marketing team is structured? How many do you have in the team and how is it structured? 
Yes, so well, we used to call it a marketing team. We now call it a place strategy team within which we do have a marketing and communications manager who is supported by a social uh, media executive and a marketing executive. We also have a team of two that are, that are dedicated to uh, supporting our occupiers. So ensuring that we communicate with them daily, ensuring that we do tell them about those joint marketing opportunities that they can uh, get involved with. Um, we have a visitor experience manager who is responsible for delivering events um, supported by an executive. So uh, they're busy today making sure the pianos are all ready, finely tuned and uh, good to go out across the estate and uh, for the next 10 weeks. Um, they're also working on a chess event, a major chess event in Chivas Park, uh, which is exciting. Um, and then we've got a team of three in terms of commercialization. So your earlier question, you know, in terms of joint marketing with partner brands. So the commercialization team will work with brands such as um, Pokemon, who come back, at, uh, always um, keen to come back and be in uh, Liverpool and Liverpool one during the school holidays. Uh, Charlotte Tilbury is a brand that's been in Coca-Cola, various pop up car shows. So that's managed by a team of three within the commercialization. So we're a team of about a dozen in total covering commercialization, occupier relations, marketing and communications and events. OK, that's interesting to hear. Um, and I think we've got time for one final question. And um, we seem to have run through quite a few already. Um, and and it's a final one. And I know you're not just purely focused on um, shopping and retail um, but the final question is um, an observation what would you say if, to those who say that digital marketing um, or online shopping is killing the high street I know we've done quite a few sessions in the last two years with Kantar who have been monitoring different trends uh, and behaviors and uh, do you think some of that may be permanent or maybe we're reverting back um, to the way things were <laughs> I think it's a really interesting question and I remember going back several years this seemed to be a very popular question with the media saying you know is digital online shopping now the death of the high street and I would say absolutely not I would I would actually say that this is very much about omnichannel this is about how brands best embrace the opportunities that digital uh, brings um, I think I referenced the term store as showroom earlier on in the presentation um, and we are finding that a lot of stores are Kind of approaching their own business models in that way where they're using the store as the opportunity to showcase brands um, and where people can get a feel for brands so they'll get involved in various activities um, and you know that drives sales and perhaps even more we, we've had a lot more inquiries for, from brands that are online only that actually want a short-term presence on the high street so uh, very interesting to see how the two work together but Certainly for, from our perspective, you know, it is a digital world and people are, are are digitally engaged and, you know, wired to their phones for the most part of the day in many in many instances. Yeah. But to be able yeah. to play in that space and showcase uh, brands, but actually people are, you know, social creatures. We do crave togetherness. And I think for us, you know, placemaking is about putting on added value opportunities for people to enjoy. Um, and for, for many of our brands to, to very much be part of that. So um, long live digital, <laughs> um, but there is a real world out there as well. So it's how the two connect and yeah. they absolutely do go hand in hand, but the most successful brands will be able to focus on, on both online and offline for the greatest success. Excellent. That's interesting to hear because there are certain things when you're shopping that you do actually have to go and have a look at <laughs> and have a sit on. Or touch or whatever. <laughs> anyway, I think we'll have to end things now because we've run out of time, but that's been fantastic. Thank you very much, Donna. So sadly, that's all the time we have. I'd like to say thank you to Donna and to the CIM Northwest Group for organising the event. And we do hope you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. And perhaps you will be arranging a trip to Liverpool when you get a moment. Um, we'll be back with our next webinar express. The Rise of the Metahumans, Imagination Made Real, which will take place on Monday the 4th of July at our usual time of 1pm. You'll find further details about the webinar on our events page where you will also be able to register for the session. So that just leaves me to say a thank you to you for joining us today and hope that you've enjoyed our webinar. So take care everyone and we look forward to welcoming you and again to our webinars in the future. <laughs>